Okay, I'll begin. So I'll begin with some reminders from last time. <clears throat> so we had uh, G, a connected Feynman graph. Um, with N, G edges, H, G loops, um, and Kinematics, masses and momenta, Q comma M. And we had graph polynomials. Um, psi G, which is the sum of a spanning trees and then the product of the Schwinger parameters not in each spanning tree. And then I'll directly define this other polynomial, Xi, which depends on Q and M. And it's the sum over all spanning two trees. And we take the product of the edges not in the spanning two tree then we take the total momentum through one of those trees, doesn't matter which, all squared. Then some factor that involves all the masses and psi g. And from this we concocted the, um, the Feynman integral Um, which was I, G, Q, M, which was some trivial factor which I'll drop. Um, integral over sigma of omega G, Q, M, where omega G, Q, M was 1 over psi G to the dimension of space time over 2, Psi g over psi g to the ng minus h g d over 2 times omega g. And um, sigma was contained in projective ng minus 1 space, and it was called the, it was the coordinate simple x. Which is where all the Schwinger parameters are positive. Okay, then from this we defined. Oh, all right then. It's a reminder. I don't want to redo the entire course. Are there new people from? Oh, wow. Okay. Goodness. Um, okay, in that case, certainly omega g is i equals 1 to ng minus 1 to the i alpha. Um, I, we omit there. Okay. So this integral can converge or diverge. We'll see exactly when in a minute. So from this, we define hypersurfaces. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so we had hypersurfaces um, xg, which is x, um, what I call x psi g, union x psi g, 
where this is just the vanishing locus of the first polynomial, which is homogeneous, and this is the vanishing locus of the second, uh, the second polynomial. So it's a family of hypersurfaces, but we're going to think of it for the time being is just fiber by fiber, so for a particular choice of masses and momenta. Um, so this is contained in P and G minus 1. Now there's an important point here, um, that in the case where G has no masses or momenta, um, then I'm going to put Xi G equals Xi Psi G. So that's very important. Um, there's another sort of stupid case that if if you if uh, and this quantity here is 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 if n g is strictly bigger than h g d over two, then then this uh, factor here is going to cancel with this factor here, and we're not going to get it in the denominator. And in fact, we can consider a simpler geometry in which we just have this hypersurface and not the other one. I'm not going to consider that case because it will just mess up the notations. But one can do slightly better in, in that case. V of f means the locus where m vanishes, I suppose. V, the vanishing locus, yeah. Absolutely, the standard terminology. Vanishing locus. OK, so an example, um, just to, I'm sorry I've given so many examples in this course, but I think it's a quick way to upload um, the main ideas into your heads. So massive. Lines are depicted with a double edge, or thickened line. Uh, one. Um, so the graph polynomial, let's just look at this one. It's the most interesting one. Equals OK, and so we had a, a notion last time of motic, m motic subgraphs. So these are the ones where something bad happens in the geometry. So the strict motic subgraphs uh, in this case are the, so motic subgraph is a subgraph such that either, when you cut an edge, either the loop number goes down, or when you cut an edge, it no longer connects to all the momenta and contains all the masses. So here, in fact, there are just two strict motic subgraphs in this case. This one, because if you cut any edge, two, for example, it will no longer connect to this external momentum. And if you cut one, then it will no longer contain the massive line one. And likewise, this is also motic. And um, these motic subgraphs tell us that something happens when certain coordinates go to zero. This tells us that when alpha 1 equals alpha 2 equals naught, the polynomial vanishes. And likewise, for this one? The remaining coordinates. Sorry? No, you consider the remaining coordinates in the final. Alpha remaining. Alpha well, you have, you have omitted alpha 3. Yeah. You have removed alpha 3. But you say now alpha 1 and alpha 2. <laughs> so the, a, a motic subgraph defines a subset of okay. edges, subset of variables. And, and, the mo and, and it's moti when it's motic, it tells us that there's some, something bad in the geometry happening when those variables go to zero. Could you yeah. what is motic? Um, motic, yeah, I defined it last time. It's quite a technical definition. It's some type of subgraph that depends on the kinematics and the masses. And Which carries a, a similarities. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a slightly subtle definition. Um, yeah, I'm afraid I, I, we won't need it this, this uh, time very much. Um, OK, so here's a picture in projective space. So we have um, L1. So last time I called the, the vanishing of the hyperplanes was called L. And this is the, the graph hypersurface um, x, 
psi g. We also mustn't forget the other graph hypersurface. It's going to lie somewhere. It's going to go around, but it's it's a hyperplane, so I'll just draw one part of it here. Um, and and so there, there's something a not a non-normal crossing situation going on in precisely the um, motic uh, loci loci where those variables vanish. This is the domain of integration here. By the way, when all the masses, if all masses were non-zero, I would have only uv problem. If all masses are non-zero. Yes. Yes. Well, then the only motic subgraph would be the, sub the whole thing itself. Exactly. So and it's only one. when the thing shrinks. When exactly. all alphas are zero, then yes. what? Yes. Well, all alpha is zero. That's not a point of the projective space. You yeah. can't take all alpha zero. But it's nowhere. There's, you can't take all alpha zero in projective space. You just coordinate. You cannot yes. all. Yeah. So you're only interested in strict mode. In that case, the only motic subgraph would be the whole subgraph, the whole graph. But we're only interested in strict motic subgraphs. And another way to say it is, is if all the alphas go to zero, that defines a point that's not in projective space. But still, this is where you want to renormalize the thing. <laughs> um, no, no, I don't. Because, oh, okay, you could have an overall. Um, so we've, we've already taken that into account. There was a gamma factor in the Feynman integral in the first lecture. And there was a, there's an overall divergence that we've already taken care of. So that's when you pass the projective coordinates, you're already um, getting regularizing the, o the overall divergence of a graph. In this case, there won't be one. But yeah, so, um, so then l last time um, we uh, did some blow ups along all the motic subspaces. And um, in this case, it looked like this. We blow up the um, the red the red points, and we get something like this. Um, so this will this has uh, boundary divisors d1, d2, d3, and d1, 3, d2, 3. Um, so this is what I call the Feynman polytope. Was defined in a canonical way, sigma g tilde, and um, in this blown-up space, the the graphite surface, as we'll show in a minute, looks like this, and it was called y, and there'll be the other one out here y. That's the strict transform of the Harper surfaces downstairs. So that's the the picture we had. Oh, this works now. Great. And that's where the denominators are. That's where the denominators are of the integrand. So all the, the possible singularities of the integrand are red, and the boundary of the domain of integration is white. So in general, we had um, xg contained in png minus 1, and we also had these coordinate hyperplanes Le, and we blew up this precise prescription with these motic subgraphs to get a new space pg. And in it, we have the strict transforms of the hypersurfaces. And in, in the case when there are no masses of momenta, we only have, we ignore this second hypersurface. So these are the strict transforms of the respective x's. And um, here we had a divisor called D, which is um, has divisors of two types, those which are just um, facets th that came from coordinate linear hyperplanes downstairs, and then there are new ones which come from blowing stuff up. Gamma motic. So we, for today we could say motic is precisely that which needs to be blown up to get a minimal compactification for uniformly for all Feynman graphs. Um, and last time, um, the main result was that we got a, oh, so this is um, strict normal crossing. And last time, we got a recursive product structure of, 
on uh, on everything, on the graph hypersurfaces, on these divisors, and on the space itself. So let me write that down. Um, so first of all, for the boundary divisors, so DE is a point across D G slash E, that means you contract the edge in the graph. Sorry, that's not right. P G slash E, that's what I meant. Um, and for the things we've blown up, there's a product structure, D gamma is P gamma cross P G mod gamma, that's the quotient graph where you contract all the connected components of gamma down to a point, down to a vertex. And these graph hypersurfaces had this um, remarkable structure that when you intersect with the boundary, they likewise decompose as a kind of product. And yg intersection d gamma equals, yeah, y gamma cross p g mod gamma. Union has two components. Um, P gamma cross <coughs> Y G mod gamma. And these identities were proved by um, proving some asymptotic factorization formulae for the graph polynomials. In the limit, as some of the alpha variables go to zero, we saw that these psi and psi polynomials miraculously factor into products of polynomials of the same type. The lowest degree. To the lowest degree, yeah, to the lowest degree, um, which is the key to many things. Okay, so now I want to um, interpret this integral as a period of cohomology, as I explained in the second lecture. So we need to think about the, the integration domain. This is the Betty homology class. Um, so, to make sense of this, we need to define a good space, good parameter space for the um, kinematics. So, I will define, for want of a better word, the generalized Euclidean region I, I show my ignorance, perhaps there's a, a better, an, another name already in the physics literature, but this seems this seems uh, fairly reasonable. So that will be a set U, which will be d in some sp space of, of kinematics, the space of possible Qs and Ms, by which I'll be deliberately slightly vague for now, where we demand that the real parts of the squares of the masses are positive for all edges which are thickened, which carry non-zero masses, so I think in the first lecture, I, I called the edges which had zero mass, the vanishing mass, Vm, the vanishing, mass vanishing edges. And we'll also impose that the real part of the sum of the partial squares of the momenta, so the squares of the partial sums of the momenta have positive real part for all subsets of external vertices uh, external half edges which carry momentum. And this is contained in a space where um, in this space, which I, I didn't write down last time, I perhaps should have done. So this is what I vaguely referred to last time as the space of generic momenta. So there, there was this assumption, all these um, blow up uh, conditions were, were conditional on being in this region of generic momenta, and now I'm going to restrict to a, a strict subspace of that for the, for the following thing. I beg, beg your pardon? V sub M and V sub Q. 
this, the, this, was the, this was in the first lecture. Um, this was the set of internal edges which don't carry mass. And this is the, the set of external edges which don't carry momenta. So I, maybe it's just, I shouldn't have used this notation. This means that for all, for all edges which carry mass, so which are thickened, which are thickened lines, we, we, if the mass is non-zero, it's strictly positive in a sense. And if the momenta are non-zero, then they're strictly positive. Because we, can ha we have some legs which carry zero external momenta, and there's no condition on those, of course. But of course, we could introduce a modern standard in working. Oh, that'll come later, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you sh you're sure you could. So, a theorem um, for all masses and momenta in this space um, the Feynman polytope, which is the the um, which I defined last time, this the pullback of the closer for the analytic topology of the pullback of the interior of the um, coordinate simplex does not meet the strict transform of the graph hypersurface. So in that picture, it means that the red the red line does not meet the the, the polytope over which we want to integrate. Did I forget something? No. Um, so proof. OK, so the proof is by induction. Um, this polytope is stratified by its faces. So in, in this picture, the, the stratification, it has, um, I don't really know how to draw it, but we have the big, um, big open cell in the middle, and then we have the open um, co-dimension one faces, and so on and so forth. So the, the big open stratum, let's call it um, sigma tilde G O for the interior. This is contained in P G minus D. By definition of the blow-up, this is isomorphic to um, P and G minus 1 minus the union of the coordinate hyperplanes. And this contains um, the open uh, coordinate simplex, where alpha i is strictly positive. And, and this isomorphism sends this uh, open stratum isomorphically on, or homeomorphically onto this thing, sigma naught. So, um, so here's a, a point that, was, that I said was an important point last time that seemed very trivial, and I sort of glossed over it. But that's that the graph polynomial is not identically zero. So I, I said that carefully last time, and this is where it's important. And um, the second, th this uh, xi polynomial is also not identically zero if, in the case when g has um, any non-trivial kinematics at all. So this was crucial in the definition of motic that the, this property. Can you treat the case of the Q and N are zero? No. Well, whether it has kinematics, but no. But the case Q and M are zero are, are, are incorporated because. We only look at. Um, no, but, uh, but it would be a different graph because you have a denominator xi. I don't. I said I don't have a denominator xi if I have um, um, no external kinematics. Because it's a sum of an empty set, so you, you get one or something like this. Oh, empty set is zero. Um, when we get a product of an empty set. Um, yeah. Yeah, if there's no kinematics, we shouldn't have psi in that. It should, should, uh, just, just the power of psi that you integrate. If there's no kinematics. Yeah, it's just the power of psi you integrate. Like, like in, the, um, in the, the examples I gave in the first lecture. Yeah, exactly. Um, where was I? Okay, so um, now the point is that the coefficients in um, the graph polynomial of psi g, that's why I wrote it up, are all plus one. Are all one or zero, 
um, but it's, it's not identically zero, so that implies that um, the graph polynomial is strictly positive on the, the locus where all the alpha i's are strictly positive. And similarly, the coefficients in psi g are all um, things like squares of momenta and me squared, stuff like this. And that implies that psi g, because it's non-zero, um, is positive, I'll put the qm back in, on sigma cross u, where u is this, this domain here. So that means that um, yg intersect sigma g tilde open is xg intersect sigma interior, and that's empty. So we've shown that the, um, the graph hypersurface doesn't meet the, the interior of this, um, of this polytope. And now, by induction, we just need to check all the, all the faces. So proceed by induction on the faces. But the faces have the good measure of being of exactly the same type, their graphs. They're Feynman polytopes of quotient motic and sub and, and quotient graphs. So this is a formula we showed last time. And so by induction, the, 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 the components of the graph hypersurface on the faces are, again, graph hypersurfaces. And we've already shown that they don't meet the corresponding polytopes. So that's done. Um, OK, fine. So um, so we can define now the graph motive. Again, this is an abuse of the word motive. It's really a, a mixed hot structure. Um, mot g, um, which will be the cohomology ng minus 1, pg minus yg, relative to d minus d intersect yg. And we think of this as an object in some category. I'll be more precise about this a little bit later on. We think of this as a Durham cohomology group and a, and a Betty cohomology group and a comparison isomorphism. So that was in, in, in lecture two. I'll be a bit more precise about that in, in a little bit later. Um, and so the point of this previous theorem is that the, we can take the homology class of the domain of integration of this Feynman polytope, and it gives a well-defined class which is in fact universal, doesn't really depend on, the construction's the same for all graphs, which is nice. Sigma g, um, which to save on notation will mean the homology, the relative homology class of this Feynman polytope in the Betty homology of this thing. And um, this is the Betty realization of this <coughs> motive dual. So D refers to the boundary of the integration domain? D, D, D is uh, the divisors, these divisors here, and the integration domain. So, so the, the singularity of the integral. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. So we're looking at, we haven't done the differential form yet, but the, the, the boundary of this. First of all, this theorem says that, so a priori sigma g tilde is contained in PGR, right? So it's a, it's a homology cycle in PG relative to D. But because it doesn't meet Y at all, we can restrict to PG minus YG with impunity. And the boundary of sigma tilde G is contained in D. 
And in fact, it's contained in d minus d intersection yg because of the theorem. And so that's precisely saying that, um, that it defines a relative homology class in this group. It's bound, it's, yeah. And that was the whole issue uh, that we had to go through with zeta 2 example in lecture 2. So the issue was getting the, the, the domain of integration to be a well-defined homology class. So a remark is that mod G um, agrees it's the same definition with the so-called graph motive defined by Bloch and Orn Kramer um, in the special case where there are no masses or momenta um, and possibly some further restrictions. Okay, so now we so we have a domain of integration, we have a homology class. Now we need a, a something to integrate. So we need the Duram cohomology class. Okay, so we had um, recall that pi g is the map from this blown up space is the blow down to um, projective space, and we want to write our integral, our Feynman integral, um, Qm. We want to put it back to the, to the space upstairs. So we're going to integrate over the Feynman polytope, and we're going to integrate the pullback of the differential form, omega gqm. And we're going to take Q and M in, of course, in this space, a subspace of generalized kinematics. General, sorry, the generalized Euclidean region. Otherwise, so this is also always conditional. So I should have, oh, it's written here. I, I said very clearly that it's, this depends on the fact that we're in the generalized Euclidean region. But still, this, this, integrand, this integral can still diverge, and that's the whole problem of renormalization. Um, so now I claim, it's not very difficult to see, but it's sort of general fact, that our domain of integration, th there are two key remarks. First of all, that the, the domain of integration upstairs is a compact polytope. And secondly, that the, the real part of... Um, the thing we want to integrate is strictly positive on so we're integrating essentially a, a positive function on a compact no, no, fact, it's, uh, you don't because you raise to some power of threshold things and real parts can be no longer positive a raise to powers? Yeah, because if you form, you, you make a ratio of two polynomials. Yeah, these are in, the in, raise to integer powers. No, but if now, um, because it's not strictly real, not real, but complex, then after raising to power, you don't get to the positive real part. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's made of a small domain. If you mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's true on real points, yeah, but it will be true in German near real points. True on real? No, but I'm, I'm on the real, I'm on... You is not real points, you see. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, small, small detail. Um, okay, thank, thank you for that. Um, yeah, that slipped my attention. So, well... Um, Okay, maybe on some slightly smaller domain. The, uh, the integral is, is absolutely convergent on some smaller domain, let's call it V. If and only if um, pi upper star G 
omega G Q M is has no poles along um, along D gamma, where gamma is motic. Okay, yeah. So perhaps we need to do, we need to shrink the domain a little bit. Um, and so to get some or well, certainly sufficient conditions for convergence, we just need to compute the order of the pole along along each uh, divisor d. Um, so, yeah, okay, yeah, so definition, um, the superficial degree of divergence um, SDG equals the number of loops times dimension over 2 minus ng, and um, you have the following lemma, which is rather easy to prove, that the order of the pole of pi upper star omega gq d along a boundary divisor D gamma is um, either one plus S D gamma if the subgraph is uh, not MM. So MM meant mass momentum spanning. It meant that the subgraph uh, connected to every external um, momentum which was external momentum which was non-trivial and contained all the masses essentially. And um, in the case when it is MM, so that's corresponds to an infrared subdivergence, we get this formula. If gamma is MM, and the proof um, is use the factorization theorems I stated last time um, plus. MM means, um, it was a definition I gave last time, mass momentum spanning. Um, so it meant that um, um, ME, if a mass is non, if there's a, a massive line, then uh, the edge is in the edge of our subgraph. <coughs> and it means that um, some connected component of gamma uh, meets, if you like, or contains con contains all um, external legs, external half edges, which carry momenta. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I feel like I've been lecturing continuously for six hours. <laughs> um, OK. Oh, yeah. So use the factorization theorems. This is a, a simple calculation. You just um, use the factorization theorems, which I gave last time, and then use the explicit coordinates for blow up. In fact, there was a formula last time where we computed the order of vanishing of a graph polynomial along a divisor using these factorizations. And the blob coordinates were simple changes of variables like b to 1 equals alpha 1 over alpha i, and so on. You just plug in these variables. and So this is very straightforward. It's something called, it's called power counting in the physics literature. Um, and so we, we get um, uh, conditions for a Feynman integral to converge, which may or may not be satisfied. 
so, um, so let's call this condition here that it has no poles. The convergence condition that it has no poles along the divisors D. Um, so if star conv holds, um, we can define the Duram class um, pi upper star omega G. Um, in the Duram group associated to the motive of G, which is H and G minus 1 Duram of this whole thing, PG minus YG relative to D minus D intersection YG. So, of course, um, when, it, when it doesn't hold, then we have a problem, and that's the subject of renormalization. So it can happen that when you pull back your integrand upstairs, you find you still have poles along the divisors D. And for in the ultraviolet case, we know how to deal with that. You renormalize. Um, it's a different topic of what I'm talking about, but it's it's just an inclusion exclusion on this on this picture. Essentially, you find you have a when you pull back your differential form, you find that it has uh, poles along some of these divisors. But because of this recursive structure, the residue will be, um, if it's a simple pole, the residue will be a product of, of, inter of Feynman integrands of sub and quotient graphs. And then you need a recipe, which comes from physics, to find a different form which has the same residue along that divisor, and you just subtract it. And then you do inclusion exclusion. You subtract these singularities along this polytope by induction on the dimension. And that gives you exactly the prescription in physics to renormalize. And you get the BPHZ prescription. And the Forrest formula comes for free out of, out of the geometry. And the kalin samansky equation comes out, pops out as well, again from this, this sort of factorization structure. So it's the geometry which determines everything. It's a blue That's just ultraviolet, yeah. Um, for infrared, I, I don't know what to do. I think. Blow up. Change of variable. Yes. Yeah. So, from the naive point of view, it's the same interval in which you have changed variables. So, if it diverges, it's still diverges. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So, I'm, I'm just saying that uh, I'm not considering the case of divergence. So, we, we could put this in um, some more work. Um, yeah, so one thing to do is to incorporate the case of the, the, the theory of renormalization into this business. So with, with Dirk Kramer, we defined the corresponding motive for, um, for divergent processes which have just a single scale. It's a different geometry. Ah, so here we concentrate on the non-divergent. We're just looking at, I'm just looking at integrals which converge. Which means UV and infrared safe. Exactly, UV infrared safe, absolutely. So three. Finally, um, yeah, Mativic Feynman amplitudes and periods. Okay, so um, let G be a connected Feynman graph as above. QM in U. Um, and let's assume that our integral is convergent in this geometric sense. And then we can define the motivic Feynman amplitude to be so I'll be more precise about this in a minute. But it'll superscript M. I Mativic GQM. And it's an element of a ring of Mativic periods of some category, some Tanakian category H, about which I will say some more in a minute. So I'll say something about that later. 
So that's the, the, the following the construction um, in the second lecture of thinking about um, a metric period is a is a um, an element of the affine ring of the torsor of isomorphisms between from a Durham to a Betty fiber functor in a certain category of realizations. And the, the gain is that we get a Galois action on it. Um, and the period, of course, so these things had a period map, period homomorphism, and it goes without saying that the period of the Mativic amplitude um, is, of course, the amplitude we started off with. So it, it had better converge, otherwise, you know, that's why we certainly need to restrict ourselves to the convergent case uh, for the time being, for the, the first step. So any and you. Okay, so what's, um, oh, sorry, I forgot to define it. My apologies. The material final amplitude is, what is it? Is the triple, the matrix coefficient, the motive of G, then um, framed by the um, pullback of the Feynman differential form upstairs and the homology class given by the Feynman polytope. Right. And um, this, this, this class is indeed a, a, a class in the Durham cohomology up here, and this is a class a du on the dual of the Betty realization of this thing. So that's a perfectly well-defined metivic period. Now, um, the next definition is slightly confusing. Um, but I, I don't, couldn't think of a very good terminology. Now, instead of looking at, so we can change this. Um, we don't have to look at this differential form. We can look at a different differential form that converges and integrate that instead. So we can actually look at any um, Durham class. And I'm just going to call it omega, and I hope it's not confusing. No, I'm going to call it omega qm, because it will depend on q and m. So omega subscript g will be the, the canonical one that comes from the physics, the actual scalar Feynman integral we're looking at. This will be a, a generalized um, integrand. So we can allow ourselves to look at these more general integrals. And we call this the motivic Feynman, not amplitude, but period. So maybe this is a, a, a bad terminology, but I want to use the word amplitude to mean the original integral we started off with, and period for a generalization where we consider any a more general integrand. <coughs> and so I m g omega, I'll drop the q and m, will be Omega sigma g. So again, a, a, a metric period in some category that I haven't quite defined yet, <coughs> and that, that will denote the period by so by ig ig omega. So what is this? Um, let's look at some examples. So an example of such a generalized Feynman amplitude or, or Feynman period would be something like this. In the case where we have kinematics, we could take any numerator and we could raise, we could take the denominators to arbitrary powers. So that would be an example of a Feynman period. It's not necessarily a Feynman amplitude. So here, A, B. Polynomial is independent of the kinematics. Yeah. We, you know, uh, we, could put, um, we could put polynomials in the kinematics. And in fact, you'd put elements of a Clifford algebra if you were considering a gauge theory. That, that has to be yeah, so, yeah, of course. Thank you. So I'm just going to write that. A, B, and Z. Um, P in 
as rational coefficients, so it's any polynomial in the, in the shrinker parameters, such that, such that the whole thing is homogeneous. So P in particular is homogeneous. And the degree has to match up. So such that um, the entire differential form defines a form on projective space. So it needs to be homogeneous of degree 0. That's the next condition, thank you, of degree 0. And, um, and it has no poles along uh, d gamma, gamma motic. So by a simple power counting argument, you can write some explicit inequalities that this polynomial has to satisfy. You can write sufficient conditions. So an example of such thing are all gauge theories. Well, I believe, certainly most gauge theories. Um, when you write, when you take a gauge theory and you write it in the parametric representation, and you do the, the Schwinger trick and so on, you get an integrand of this form. And the numerators will contain um, stuff in a Clifford algebra, for example, that uh, contains all the data of your gauge theory. So uh, Kramer has been working on this recently and has an efficient way to produce integrands. I beg your pardon? All integrals that are convergent. So uh, an example of a, a, a Feynman period is any is an integral of this type that is convergent. Ah, a con the convergence sex condition on integral and gauge theory. Yeah. Oh, the, and so you're asking about gauge theories. Yeah. So what was the question? Then? No, no, it's, it's automatically in gauge series. In, in gauge theory, it won't automatically converge, no. It will still diverge. Again, you have to renormalize. When you say gauge you mean amplitude in gauge theories, or you mean endpoint functions? Oh, this was an offhand remark to say that when you consider amplitudes in a gauge theory, you normally write them in momentum space or something. Or then, when you write them, if you write them in parametric form, it will naturally produce integrands of this type with higher powers of the graph polynomials occurring in the denominator and some typically extremely complicated numerators involving traces of gamma matrices and all sorts of stuff. But the, the general shape is of this. So in particular, the amplitudes which are convergent that you get from gauge theories will always be linear combinations of these, will be, will be periods of the same motive. So if you know all the periods of your motive, you know all possible amplitudes for all possible theories with that topology. So you're saying it's like the theory of Abelian integrals of the first and second kind so that you can express all Abelian integrals in combination? Absolutely. So, so I was going to say this later on, but let maybe say it now. Um, in some sense, the, the, the key word for physicists would be uh, the phrase master integrals. So, so there are lots of a huge amount of work trying to reduce amplitudes to a small class of master amplitudes out of which you can express everything. And the mathematical way to think about this is just to write down a basis for the Durham cohomology. So I feel like saying that one, if you write down, if you can compute this cohomology, and we'll get this at the end, and write down the differential forms and calculate the periods, then you're done. You've done all possible, you've computed all possible amplitudes. And then whichever theory you look at will pick out which particular linear combinations of amplitudes you need. So I, one should, yeah, one should only compute Feynman amplitudes once and once and for all and then never again. And the, the particular choice of theory will select which amplitudes, well, which, sorry, which periods should, are of relevance in that theory. Okay, so these are examples of what I call Feynman periods, and I hope the term is not confusing. Okay, so now finally the cosmic Galois group. Um, so let graph QM be the set of connected Feynman graphs with, um, with Q external momenta. So we're going to fix the number of external momenta because this is what we observe, some particles coming in and some particles coming out, and, M, and in a theory with m possible masses. So these are the possible masses that 
particles are allowed to take. And we can define a space of kinematics somewhat, uh, somewhat crudely to be AD. So this is the, the possible momenta we could have. And these are the possible masses we could have. And the field of fractions of this affine space we call K. So this is frac. Um, and it's just the field in which we join um, the momenta and the masses. And of course, this is a slightly dumb thing to do because as physicists know extremely well, we, we only interested in, in, in the invariance under your, the orthogonal group. So it would be better to look at just um, the dot products of masses, of, of momenta, and, and, and so on. In other words, use Mandelstam variables as... Masses or square of masses? Oh, sorry, square of masses, yeah. Because the amplitude... Uh, yeah. The amplitude only depends on some, um, some subset of, of the full data of masses and momenta. So we can do better, but I... Physicists know this extremely well. There's no need to go into details. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I'm these are called Mandelstam variables. But it, we, we don't really, we can just work with this for now. It's, it's, yeah. um, so HQM will be a, a category whose objects are, um, so apologies for being slightly technical, it'll be something Betty, something Duram, with a weight filtration and a Hodge filtration, and a comparison isomorphism. And these will be on some uh, Zariski open subset of the space of kinematics. So we fix the number of masses and number of external variables we're allowed. I mean, the masses can occur with repeats, of course. It's just the number of possible particle masses that are allowed. Um, here, the category consists of triples, or rather pairs, with, um, where this is a local system of finite dimensional Q vector spaces on the complex points of some open in the space of kinematics. V Duram is an algebraic vector bundle over Q, the finite type, with a flat connection and regular singularities at infinity on SQ. Sorry, on SQ. And there's a whole bunch of axioms that I don't want to go into. What are these objects? So this is, um, so think of this, uh, we had this, bef this cohomology before, we had, in lecture two, we had Betty homology. We had uh, Betty homology of something. So we had mod G, okay, so fiber-wise, we had mod G had, had its Betty incarnation, which was um, YG, sorry, PG minus YG C relative to um, D minus D intersect YG C. And it also had the Duram which is uh, differential forms. OK, so n now, so I was thinking of yg as static. It's a fixed, we fixed q and m. Now I let q and m move. So this is a vector space that is moved. This is a, a, a finite dimensional q vector space that moves. So that defines a, uh, a locally constant sheaf. It's called the local system. And on such a thing, you have a monodromy in action of a fundamental group, which encodes the notion of monodromy. On the other hand, differential forms. Now again, we can move the differential forms because they have parameters in them, and we get um, a vector bundle. And we can also differentiate with respect to masses or differentiate with respect to any parameter, and that gives you, so us the Gauss-Mannin connection, which is this connection here. And on each fiber, we can compare Betty and Duram after tensing with C, and 
That's what I explained in the second lecture. And if you package all everything one would like about this possible structures, we have some some category in which that contains all the data we might want to use at some point. But it, it contains different this this for physics. This is um, the Picard Fuchs equations. That it contains all the information about differentiation with respect to masses and momenta. Um, this thing contains information about monodromy. I'm sorry, it's slightly technical, but yes? C is comparison. So remember we, that these, after tensoring with C, that's integration. That tells us how to take a differential form and pair it with a, 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 an integration cycle. So this satisfies a bunch of axioms that's slightly long, but um, that's why I postponed this to the last lecture. Um, we have a, a fiber functor, omega Duram. So actually the simplest is to view this category over this big field. We have a fiber functor to vector vectors, vector spaces over this, this big field of fractions, which is the fiber at the generic point. of the vector bundle V Duram. And so, oh sorry, H. So HQM is a Tanakian category um, over the field KQM. Um, and if you don't like all this stuff, then we can just take the case Q and M to be zero, no masses, no momenta, and then it's just Q and this category H naught naught is exactly the category I called H in the second lecture. OK, so from this we can define the cosmic Galois group. At last. So, um, Oh yeah, so we have, as I explained in the second lecture, we have the automorphisms of this fiber functor is a, an affine group scheme and it acts on the Duram of the cohomology on the differential forms, if you like, for all graphs. The type we're interested in. Beg your pardon? And I can pick not all the field keep but for rational numbers. <coughs> um, yeah, I'm nervous about that. You want to you want to say that the you want to do some descent. So uh, of course it should be cops of local system. Yeah, I'm nervous about that. Okay. I'm nervous about that. And the reason is because um, the periods will, will involve rational functions of masses and momenta. So if, if we if we had wanted to have a a, a Tanakian category of a Q, then the periods of weight zero would so the Galois invariance would be would be rational numbers, and we'd only get rational numbers out. But clearly, when you, you can write down an integral that gives a rational function in Q and M. Yeah, but still, this category of, of, of it's defined over Q. I know it's kind of defined over Q, and I'm nervous about this because um, there are these theorems in in yeah. So you, the the claim is you can construct. No, here it's not even rational functions, so it's transcendental functions of you know. No, no, no. They're, they're, they're trans yeah, but the coefficients of the periods will have to be functions of rational functions of Q and M. Yeah, so you can write if you write down the, the first the first Feynman integral we compute will be you can write down an, an integral that's you know m m one squared or something. So this is a period of of a trivial representation, and um, means you have to have coefficients in M. You, you can apply it by mathematical, and you can write down. You know the integrals will will, and, and will be this type. So it's crucial to to work over this bigger field. Um, and if you want to, if if you could find a point that's, or you could then specialize and take, fix the masses and momentum and get go to Q. But I don't want to do that. No ramification depending on the parameters Q and M. That's what you say. No, no, there could be ramification everywhere. That's what why, what makes me nervous about this, um, is that you could, that these Feynman integrals could have singularities over a subspace of kinematic space that becomes dense when you look at all Feynman diagrams. So you could have ramifications as a dense subset of the space, and that's what makes me nervous when you want to do a wick rotation 
so there are, there are results in the physics literature that claim that you can continue on the physical sheet of something. I don't understand them, and I'm, I don't want to go into that. So there's, there's something that needs to be seriously looked at. Um, okay, so we have a, a, a Tanaka group that acts on all these things, and it has a, a huge subgroup which is trivial. So let triv qm be the subgroup acting trivially on all um, on all uh, cohomologies of Feynman diagrams. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, and then so finally we can define the cosmic Galois group a long last G cosmic QM is this huge Tanaka group modulo the bit we're not interested in, which is the one that acts trivially on all Feynman diagrams. So this is an affine group scheme over this field. And so what we get, what we get is this group um, acts on all motivic Feynman periods. PM, H, Q, M. For all G in graph Q, M. Note that if it can happen that your graph the, the Feynman amplitude you're initially interested in doesn't converge, but it has other periods by putting numerators or so on for which it does converge. So we need to consider all the graphs, not just the convergent ones. So some of the genes are for Galois and some are for graph. Ah, yeah. That's why it's got a cause, cause here. CUS. OK, so um, some consequences, and then we'll have a break. So, oh yeah, the first remark is then, that what are the Galois conjugates of a, let's just look at the principle, the sort of the, the Feynman amplitude, the original one we're interested in. The Galois conjugates of a convergent Feynman amplitude are the Feynman periods, are the motivic Feynman periods. So if you're interested in, in the, the structure of the periods, you're forced to consider these more general types of integrals. I am G omega. And there's a, a formula for the corresponding coaction, which is, I'll remind you from the second lecture. So we have a coaction, nabla, from the ring of motivic periods to the affine ring of. Uh, cos qm. So this encodes the action of the Galois group on the ring of periods. <coughs> and Del this is Del did I say nabla? I meant delta. Thank you, sorry. Um, so the formula is this. You take this matrix coefficient, let's apply it to a general Feynman period and it maps to omega e i chech and the sum is over where e i a basis of the Durham cohomology which is something we can compute. I mean, and, and EI Chech is the dual basis. So this is a completely computable formula. That's why you're forced to, to get out of the... That's why you're forced. So the, the, the Galois, you start off with an amplitude here, and you're forced to consider the Galois conjugates are um, 
are these guys. So that's your, you're forced to consider more general integrands. But still the same kind of thing. Still, and, and, but the geometry is the same. Geometry is the same, yeah. Will you explain this, what it means? It doesn't work, or should I um, join the break? Do you want a break? Right, yeah, maybe we should have a break now, and then I'll give the consequences afterwards. OK, I'll, I'll just give a list of uh, consequences, and I'll come back to um, Tipo's question in a minute. Um, so what's the upshot of this uh, machine machinery? It's that every um, Mativic Feynman period In particular, Feynman amplitude, IMG omega, now defines, or in fact, it generates a representation, a finite dimensional representation. of this huge group. But we shouldn't take the group so seriously. It's something like absolute Galois group of Q or something. It's huge. What, but what we're interested in is the, the, these finite dimensional representations. And they're something that we can compute in, in, uh, in, in cases using this kind of formula. So in particular, every amplitude um, now defines a representation. And it has a dimension, for example. So we get a new invariant of a Feynman graph, which is the dimension of the corresponding representation. We also gain um, a weight filtration um, on Feynman amplitudes, amplitudic Feynman periods. Um, another remark is that the period... And we also get connection. Yeah, we get all sorts of stuff. So I'll, I'll give a small list of consequences, but um, there'll be lots and lots of applications that I don't have time to even scratch the surface of, as you say. The mark is that the period of the, um, the actual Feynman amplitude, um, because of the, the geometry we did, actually, it's immediate to show that it's a single-valued function on the Euclidean region. Um, so as, as Maxim pointed out, we, we also get um, free, we get uh, Picard Fuchs equations, we get a connection, so we can differentiate with respect to masses and momenta, we can apply all the theorems from algebraic geometry, and we have a monodromy and all these uh, structures are compatible with this Galois, with this Galois action, this coaction, with motivic coaction. So let me say something about Picard Fuchs equations. It's clear what happens when you do, you, if you want to, you start off with a, a, an integrand that depends on masses momenta, and you differentiate under the integral sign. So we differentiate omega, then it, it's the same as differentiating omega here, and omega doesn't appear here. So you see immediately that there's an equation. The, the, the action of Nabla factors through the left-hand side of this, um, this formula. So there are lots of things one can do in that direction. We can also then rigorously speak of mixed Tate, um, mixed Tate motivic periods. So those are the motivic Feynman amplitudes, where the, the mixed Hodge structure is equivalent to one which is mixed Tate. And these ones don't just have a weight filtration, they have a weight grading. So we can, we can actually speak about the, the we can assign a, a degree to each of these things. Um, and they typically give polylogarithms by general theorems about variations of such things. And from this, we can um, define symbols. So I mention this because it's become a very big industry in, in physics at the moment. Um, so the symbol 
um, there's this considerable confusion about the symbol, but the symbol, it would seem to me, would be what you get from this metabolic period where you forget almost everything. You forget the domain of integration and you just retain the differential form and its connection. And then from that you can construct some symbol from it and people have been using this a lot. But in some sense it's, the, the symbol's a bad thing to do because you lost the period, you've lost the connection with numbers. Once you throw away the domain of integration, you are not allowed to integrate anymore. And um, so it's much better just to work with the metabolic periods. Okay, so I just gave a list of, of applications of this theory. Um, so for example, now we, we have something like the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron, which is a, a sequence of numbers. And now we can replace it with a sequence of representations. So numbers can be lifted to, to finite dimensional representations of some group. And what that means for physics, I have no idea. But I, um, I think it may have some impact on questions of resummability and so on. What? Resummability. So when we want to resum, you're adding, we're naively adding numbers up together, and we hope that it's convergent or Borel resummable. But these numbers aren't just numbers, they're representations. So perhaps we should sum more intelligently and take into account the types of representations that we get. So can we understand this automatic proof uh, in one example? Um, what is this action on this set of coils? So these are the, the, uh, the, the things I gave at the very, in the very first lecture. I gave, okay. oh, which you missed. Um, I gave some examples. Um, I gave examples like um, I gave something like uh, log two, um, and the the coaction. I mean, the, the Galois conjugate is just one. So the representation associated is um, is Q log two. Uh, Direct sum Q. So it's a two-dimensional, I call this V, I think. It's a two-dimensional representation. And um, the, how does the group act? Well, given a G in the appropriate Galois group, GQ, um, it sends, it acts on log two via, um, it, mul it scales it by some rational multiple, and it adds some other rational number. So this is in Q star, and this is in Q. And so the, the, the action of this group um, factors through. And so the image of the Gallo group in this case is, is an additive group, semi-direct, a multiplicative group. And, and one is fixed. One, one is fixed because it's, um, it's a rational, it's the invariance under this metabolic Gallo group. So I gave lots of examples like this in my first lecture. And, and really, it amounts to change the branch of the logarithm. In some sense, yeah, in some sense. In some sense. In an arithmetic, we change the branch of the logarithm. Absolutely. So when we have, um, so I wrote down the motive corresponding to this, I think, in the second lecture. And we computed that it was two-dimensional. We computed a basis for the cohomology. And just from the definitions, we worked out that this was the way that the Galois group had to act. And so you have numbers, and you know how they, how they are transformed under the um, metabolic Gallo group. So this one here has weight. Sure you not two by I, but plus. No, because I'm looking at the Duram, Duram Gallo group. So let me just finish the, this chain of thought. So we have numbers, and we know how they, they transform, like multiple zeta values. And now we have Feynman integrals, and we, I'm going to say in a minute about something about how they transform. And when we put the two together, we will get some very strong constraints about the possible numbers that can occur in physics. And so to come back to Maxim's question about Duram, the reason I'm, I look at the Duram action is because this, this um, Betty class is given to us. The last thing I want to do is move it around. It's, it's, it's absolutely canonical, and it's really simple. The differential form, on the other hand, is something that changes for every graph. It's got all this, this complicated psi and xi in it. So moving that, it's already complicated. Let's doesn't matter moving on, but I'm, I don't want to mess with the Betty class. Is every finite dimensional representation of this type? I mean, uh, an amplitude or period? Of, of this group, the cosmic Gallo group, by definition. 
every finite dimensional representation of this cosmic Galois group okay. is uh, a, 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 yeah. That's the Tanner Kern philosophy. Yeah, that's that, that. So one way to define that the Hopf algebra of this group is is by th exactly these symbols, and with the co-product. Um, well, let, let me write it down. So the, 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 it's the it's the Hopf algebra generated by symbols, mod g. Uh, V, F, D, R, and there's an equivalence relation hidden in here that's very subtle, don't forget. And then the, the co-product is um, the same formula, exactly as I, I, as I wrote in, in the, the second lecture. But now V and F are of the same family. Yeah, so V and F, so the Duram here means, so Duram means, uh, in the notation in the second lecture, omega Duram, omega Duram. So V is in mod G Duram, and F is in mod G Duram dual. So if you like, this is a more concrete way to do it. You, you look at every Feynman graph, or even just a fixed Feynman graph, we're not interested in all of them, and um, we have this equivalence class of triples, and there's this explicit formula for the Co-product that defines a Hopf algebra, and its spectrum is the the quotient of this huge group, which acts on this particular graph. So the the, the huge group is artificial; it's like a projective limit of all these all possible. Or the the Hopf algebra is the limit of all possible such Hopf algebras. It's a bit of multiplication <coughs> corresponding to the cosmic Galois uh, group. Yeah, yeah. Th so this corresponds to multiplication of the cosmic Galois group. Yeah. Um, and but the problem, yeah. It's always in so in Galois theory. I mean, you have a huge Galois group which is mythical, and you control the exactly. finite portion. Yeah, so we shouldn't take the cosmic Galois group so seriously. It's just a a, a, a projective limit of all all possible quotients that we'd ever be interested in. Okay. And so it's a projective limit of finite dimensional group. Absolutely, absolutely. It's it's a pro-algebraic group. Um, Okay, so there are a lot of consequences of this um, setup, but in some sense, what we've done so far is nothing because there's no theorem yet. I mean, it's just a definition, it's just a formalism. And to actually make this do something useful for us, we need a theorem. So that's, that's what's coming next. So we need to use this very special geometry. So I call these face maps. And we're going to define relations between um, motivic periods for different graphs. So recall that we had DE contained in PG and D gamma, these facets, um, And we have the inclusion, there's a morphism which is inclusion of facets, um, or more generally faces, but let's look at facets. So the complement of the graph hypersurface in each facet can be embedded into the big space because it's part of the boundary. And likewise, P gamma minus Y gamma cross PG mod gamma minus YG mod gamma embeds. And so I claim that these induce morphisms on cohomology, on relative cohomology, both Betty and Aram. So this is a sort of standard fact, but let me um, try to motivate it with a very simplistic example. Um, so when we do relative cohomology, as I mentioned in the second lecture, there's a long exact cohomology sequence. When you have a subspace Z contained in X, I think I wrote this down in the second lecture. And so the long exact sequence gives you a map from something in the boundary into the relative cohomology. 
and it changes the degree. So we're interested in this map where you, the boundary goes into, where we, we get some information from the boundary. Um, so theorem, um, for every facet, um, F, so it'll be of the form DE, it's one of these devices, DE or, or D gamma, a blown up one, um, exceptional divisor. There is a canonical map. Um, IF, and according to the two different situations we're in, it will send the motive of the quotient graph, the graph on which we've uh, contracted an edge, into the motive of the full graph. And the tensor product of the motives of the um, subgraph and the quotient graph into mod g in the case where f equals d gamma. And what does it do on the Betty? So this does something terrible on, on differential forms. It's, it's quite hard to compute what this does on differential forms. But on the Betty things, it's very nice. And that's one reason why I don't want to uh, change the Betty classes ever. So it'll give a map the other way. And what it does to our polytopes is very nice. It takes essentially the Feynman polytope in the big space and you just take the corresponding face, the corresponding facet in this case. Sigma tilde according to what? Um, yeah, that, well, I did a slight, because I was lazy with the notations, I called um, sigma g was the homology class oh. of the tilde. Okay, okay. I wanted to simplify notations because I didn't want to keep writing. Now, but geometrically, you have to blow up something. Yeah, we've already done the blow up, so we're just, um, it's just the restriction map, the map when you intersect with the face. And on the level of, 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 of homology classes, it does this. But geometrically, it's just restricting, um, intersecting with a, taking that part of the boundary. So this implies um, um, face relations between motivic Feynman periods. And what are they? So by the definition of um, a matrix coefficient, a morphism gives us a relation. So what are the, let me write them out. So the matrix coefficient mod G E omega sigma G E is equivalent to I F to Ram of Omega and then Sigma G. And we get another relation. So Omega one. Um, is equal to yeah um, sigma g. So what is what is this? This is a, a, an equation that takes a generalized 
Feynman period for a big graph and says it's actually equal to so certain generalized Feynman periods on the big graph is actually equal to a period of a smaller graph, a graph in which you contract an edge. And likewise here, it's saying that certain periods for big graphs are actually products of periods for qu sub and quotient graphs. So these are relations between periods, and this is the key to the whole story. And likewise, we can, we can either iterate this or look at faces of higher co-dimension. I only looked at facets, just to, for simplicity. And the remark, and so I'm running behind, so I'll say the remark in words, is that um, a curiosity here is that if we started off with a graph with general kinematics, it's always the case that either the sub or the quotient has no kinematics at all. And that means um, the, the amplitudes of diagrams with no kinematics plays a very special role. So if you, you're only interested in Feynman diagrams with lots of external particles, when you study the, the periods, they will always keep dipping into the space of periods of graphs with no kinematics at all. And physicists often say to me, why are you looking at fight the four theory? Um, you know, it's not very relevant theory. It's got no masses, it's got no momenta. We don't, we're not interested in that. There are lots of good answers to that criticism, but this is probably the best because it says, even if you're interested in graphs with many momenta and many masses, you will end up finding these periods in, in the massless and momentumless uh, case coming in, whether you like it or not. Okay, so now I need to say something. So then the, the, the key point now is that every um, every uh, Feynman period of small weight will actually come from a, a sub or quotient graph. So, so now I need to talk about weights and then state the main theorem. So um, this ring of periods um, P has an increasing weight filtration um, and it was defined by the weight filtration on the Duram realization on the weight of the, the differential form in the second lecture. So perhaps I should remind you that, that, that a metivic period um, m omega sigma uh, is of weight less than n if omega was in weight n m Duram. Which means some behavior at infinity according to the linear. The weight is defined by going to some compactification. Oh, uh, yeah, we'll, 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 see, we'll see how to think about the weight. Um, it, yeah, it's kind of subtle. Um, so, the, a general fact about the weights, um, we had the motive is, is in Duram is this relative thing, and it's a general fact. We know that it has, um, the, the weight minus one part of this is zero, and the weight 2n thing is the entire space. So that means its, its weights are contained in 0, 2n, in some sense. But it's a filtration, of course. But we, you can write that the weights are contained between 0 and 2n. Um, so now let's think about, just as a, a baby example, to look at weights. We had this relative um, cohomology sequence. And then it goes into and m, n is number of edges minus one. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then this maps to h n p g minus y g, and so on and so forth. So let's let's look at the sequence and think about the weights. So th this thing has has weights anywhere between zero and two n. And uh, this thing, by, the, by similar 
argument has weights anywhere between 0 and 2 n minus 2 because the cohomological degree is n minus 1. And by theorem due to by, by Deligne, this has weights in the interval n to n since um, this is smooth. No, no, smooth is. I don't know. No, it's not affine because we've blown up. It's not affine, definitely not, because we've got all these exceptional divisors. So, um, so this is sort of a simple case to motivate what I want to do next. Um, so since we know that the, the, a deep fact that the weight filtration is a strict filtration, so that means that the graded weight is an exact functor. And that means that if we had any class in Durand cohomology, which is of weight <coughs> um, less than or equal to n minus 1, so that means that omega is weight n minus 1 mod g Durand, then um, it would go to 0 here because the weights are between n and 2n. It would land in w n minus 1 of this, which is 0. And therefore, it has to come from the boundary. It has to come from this thing. So it actually lies in the image of this, which is w, in fact, in n, in, comes from w n minus 1 of h n minus 1 dr d. So the, the slogan is that um, the differential forms of low weight must necessarily come from the boundary. It's not obvious that the weight is preserved in these mappings. Oh no, so th this is a morphism, these are morphisms of mixed hot structures, yeah. so they preserve the weight, absolutely. Contrary to the dimensional degree of the differential form, which is not preserved. No, no, the degree of the differential form is not preserved, but the weights are preserved, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, so so the Durham classes of low weight come from the boundary. Okay. So what's the general theorem? Let me write F i for the face of co-dimension i. So it's a co-dimension mod i. So i is some indexing set telling me which, which divisors d I want to intersect. So the face i could be this point. It's, it's d1 intersects d13. I'm slightly behind, so I won't write all the, the messy notations. And each face defines a, um, a, a, a motive in the same way. Uh, the same way as we saw in, in this, uh, in, in the previous uh, paragraph. So we have a corresponding graph motive for every face. And the theorem then, which uses um, all this, this, this geometric structure of the graph motive, that um, we sum over all facets of a certain codimension, i equals ng minus k minus 1. And we look at the weight k part of the Durham cohomology of the facet. And the f we have the, the, all the face maps from the previous. So these are i, f, i, Durham. And it maps into mot g Durham. And the theorem is that this map is surjective. So it means that every differential form on the big Feynman graph, which is of low weight, must come from um, part of the boundary. So the, the weight zero periods come from the, um, the zero-dimensional boundary. The weight one stuff comes from the one-dimensional boundary, and so on and so forth. So we have a total control on the low weight of this um, motive. So the proof is, is this geometric product structure we have plus a, a box standard spectral sequence and, and the theory of weights. So 
So at last we can get to the main theorem. Uh, put it here, the main theorem. So G connected Feynman graph and let's look at it, let's look at some metabolic Feynman period. So main theorem. which is a sort of Galois closure type theorem. And it says that every Galois conjugate G I M G omega, so G and G cos of the appropriate uh, let's put H Q M. Um, so every Galois conjugate which is of, of low weight is something that we already know about. It comes from a small graph. So if it's of weight less than k, then it is a linear combination of products Um, where gamma i are quotients of motic subgraphs. So quotient means contracting edges, and such that the number of edges e gamma r is at most k plus 1. That's correct. And the proof is the previous theorem plus the face relations. <coughs> well, in particular, every gal will. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah it really oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't change much. Okay, so what, what is this? What is this theorem saying? It's saying that um, that not every Galois conjugate is the period of a, of, a, of a smaller graph, but every Galois conjugate of small weight is the period of a smaller graph. So we want to think of this as a th as a statement of the kind Feynman periods are closed are closed under the action of this Galois group. Um, with, in, in this sense, with this, with this single restriction. So that's a very strong constraint on, on amplitudes. And so I will now explain, uh, explain how to make this work. So this is the principle of small graphs. I hope this is starting to tie up with what I said in, in the first lecture. Um, and the, uh, the point is that there are very few, there are very few Feynman graphs with a bounded number of edges. And so the main theorem so we shall write them down, compute their periods, and the main theorem will then give us a constraint on all amplitudes to all loop orders. So the main theorem will give constraints on the possible amplitudes to all loop orders in the perturbation theorem. No, I don't need to. I just I can just say that. So this is well. I'll, I'll give some more examples in the spirit of. Um, in the spirit of the first uh, lecture.
So yeah, so what's the, the program then is to, um, instead of computing amplitudes as numbers, what we should be doing is computing the motives. Compute mod g Duram for very small graphs. And these are pathetically small. I'll, I'll show you in a minute. It's enough. You get non-trivial statements by doing some very simple calculations. And, and as I said before, the, the cohomology, if you compute this vector space, that tells you something about all possible master integrals. So once you've done this up to a certain point, you know everything about all possible master integrals up to that point, and you know something about all possible periods up to that weight for any quantum field theory. So what could have happened, so if, if we were thinking about periods have a weight filtration, you, you'd say, okay, what, let's look at the periods of weight one or two, like, like the, the logarithm, the, di the motivic log two, and, and you look at graphs of one loop and two loops, and you compute them, and you get some the numbers. And a priori, as you keep going up and up with higher and higher loop orders, you keep getting more and more periods of low weight, and it becomes an infinite space that's out of control. But the main theorem tells you that that can't happen, that it saturates. If, if you've not seen a period at k plus 1 edges, then you'll never see it ever again. So let's uh, do this. Well, zeta 3 you feel at some stage and not yeah. before. Can you explain? Yeah. Well, let, let's give some examples. I'm, I'll Maybe I'll give myself an extra 10 minutes if that's uh, okay, since it is the last lecture. So let's start off with um, let's start off with graphs with masses and momenta, and do some really trivial, some um, pathetic calculations. But the point is to illustrate the power of this theorem. So the one-edge graphs is, is uh, it's just too trivial. I'm going to not bother with that. Two edges. So what we want to do is write down graphs with two edges. So here's a graph with two edges. So two massive lines and a momentum coming in, going out Q. And the only interesting graph polynomial here is the Xi, which is this. And so this, the, the hyperplane, it, we're, in, we're in P1, it's pretty simple. This just defines a point in P1. So the motive is just h1 of p1 minus a point, and the, there's nothing to blow up here. The boundary, the, the coordinate simplex is just two points, zero infinity. And so this is just a q of naught. So the only generalized periods you could ever get from this graph are rational numbers. It's kind of not interesting. We only get rational numbers or rational functions of q and m. And then we, there's another slightly more interesting one loop graph, uh, two edge graph, which is this one. And now the graph polynomial, or the, the xi polynomial is a bit more interesting. It defines a quadratic function of alpha one, alpha two. And so we can compute the motive there's also psi, which is alpha 1 plus alpha 2. And the motive is just h1, p1, minus 3 points relative to 0 infinity. And that we can, we know what that is. It's just a direct sum of two Kummer extensions. And so the motivic periods are only log a 1 motivic logarithm of some quantity x1 and motivic logarithm of some other quantity x2, which you can compute. It's just some function of Q and M, and I think it's called the Chilean function in physics. And then there are other more trivial examples, you know, which are kind of trivial. So that's it. We've understood all, we've classified all possible motivic periods that can come from two edges. And Uh, 
So x1 is some, um, some, uh, some function of q and q squared and the mi squared, where um, given by the intersections of these hypersurfaces with the, with the various coordinate hyperplanes. And so there's some rational functions. It's some, some horrible expression, square root of q squared minus m1 squared plus m2 squared minus 4 m1 m2. So just given by Newton's formula. I didn't want to write it down. But in the case q equals naught, one of them is just um, m1 over m2. This is one of, the, one of the quantities you can get out of this integral. If you put q squared equals naught, it's, it's simpler. And if you put m1 equals naught, you get, I think, something like log q squared plus m1 squared over m2 squared. But the, the general thing's um, got some, some square root, it's some complicated expression. I don't want to write it down. You just solve this equation, yeah. You just solve this equation equals zero or something. You just sol solve these two equations in projective space, and you get some quadratic thing. I, it, I didn't want to write it down because it's ugly. But I think, in, in, I'm, I think it's called the Chilean function. I'm not entirely sure. OK, so we've classified all possible metallic Feynman periods um, at two edges. Um, that's kind of trivial. And they're all of the form logarithm of some rational function, some sorry, some algebraic function of the masses and momenta, which I, I didn't write down. And this is a special case. When, um, algebraic, they can have a, a square root because of Newton's formula. Yeah. So now we, we, we've understood that. So now we move on to three edges. And um, let's look at the triangle graph with masses everywhere. One, two, three. And now we, we look at the motive. It's just h2 of p2 minus a quadric. Um, maybe, maybe quadric union hyperplane, actually. Sorry. Relative to, in the generic case, there'll be nothing to blow up. It'll be relative to the coordinate hyperplanes. And in any case, it's clear to see that this is mixed tate. And the weight graded pieces of of type q zero, q minus one, q minus two. You can do that without any calculation, really. And so we know by general facts about variations of mixed state hot structures that the periods are linear combinations of dialogarithms. <coughs> okay, so the metallic dialogarithm has its its co Coaction is given by, so it's reduced coaction, is given by this formula. This is a logarithm. And what we know from the main theorem um, is that the, the right hand side of the coaction. Maybe it needs to be slightly modified in this case, but we know we know that the right-hand side of the um, coaction on the amplitude is necessarily of the form of something we've already computed. So LC of the Feynman periods of the quotient graphs with two edges, the two edge quotients of this graph. So what you do is you, you contract an edge here, and you get back this graph. And we've already computed its amplitude. And that tells you what the right-hand side of the corresponding dialog term is in the full expression. So the reason I mention this is because there are many some recent results in the physics literature where people have done exactly this. They've computed um, s some small f um, amplitudes like this as analytic functions, very complicated expressions with dialogarithms of crazy arguments. And then they've um, written down the symbol, which is not unrelated to this. They compute the co-product on the symbol. 
and then they observe and conjecture that it's, it can be re-expressed in terms of Feynman diagrams. And th the main theorem says that we know this is always true, that the right-hand side will always be expressible in terms of Feynman diagrams. So this explains a lot of, um, lot of uh, phenomena in, in the physics literature. Okay, so we can keep playing that game. But I'm going to stop that for now and switch to um, switch to um, cases with no masses and no momenta, like in the first lecture. So now let's look at some more exciting examples from massless fight the four theory. So I did a lot of these in lecture one. So the only way, let's think about how we could get a period, a, uh, a period, a metallic period of weight up to two, so something like a logarithm, um, by the, the theorem is from an H1 or an H2. So we only need to look at um, two or three edge graphs. So the most interesting case is the three edge graphs. So what we do on the back of an envelope, we write down three edge graphs with no masses and momenta. So there's this one. There's this one. There's this one. I think that's it. And now, because we're, we're looking in the massless, momentumless case, we're only interested in the first graph polynomial. So here it's alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3. So we have these four examples, and in each case, we want to write down the motive. And um, we can do this. But in fact, just by staring at it, it's, it's obvious. It's very easy to see that um, it's mixed eight. The last graph has six. Oh. It's not <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's just a bubble. It's three tadpoles glued together. Still yeah, it still has six lines. Yeah, no, right. It has, still has six lines. You're absolutely right. But that's not a problem. Because we need to consider, when we look at the Galois conjugates of an amplitude, it will involve the quotient graphs in which we contract edges. And if you, even if you start off with a four-valent theory, um, okay. we may be forced to contract this line and it will for give us a six-point function. So the, 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 the Galois group will necessarily go outside um, graphs of a fixed degree of um, vertices. But th th it doesn't matter. There are very few cases. We check that they're all mixed eight and unramified. So unramified means that when you reduce modulo any prime, um, something funny doesn't happen. And this is obvious because all the coefficients in these polynomials are one. So nothing. No, no monomial will disappear, for example, when you reduce modulo 2 or 3. So without doing any thought, in fact, without any calculation, we know that there are no non-trivial periods coming from three-edge graphs. So there's nothing. Um, and in particular, so that means there are no weight periods of up to weight 2 at all occurring ever in fight the 4 theory as Galois conjugates. So it's a very special case. Um, we certainly get no log p for p a prime. And in particular, we get no log 2. So this so never occurs as a Galois conjugate at any loop order in the entire perturbative expansion. Sorry? 
Yeah. Yeah. So yes. Why, why don't you get two pi i? Two pi i. Yeah. Um, because uh, because the period is real. It's the the domain of integration is Frobenius invariant. So the, the yeah the Frobenius um, fixed the, the the Betty path. So I know it's Frobenius invariant. It's a real number, so I can't get two pi. Um, right. So yeah. So okay. So we get a corollary. So this is a, a theorem, a statement that's true to all orders in perturbation theory. It's completely rigorously proved. Um, and then make it, make it even more special. Let me take a, a, a graph in fight the four theory, which is primitive log divergent, and restrict this statement to this very special class of graphs where the motive is mixed state. And ramified it too. I mean, this is not necessary condition. Then, um, then the corresponding amplitude never has log 2 as a Gadol conjugate. So that's a statement about infinitely many Feynman graphs. And um, Fight the Four Theory has the good fortune of giving examples which we expect to satisfy this condition. So for example, we can look at there are some nine and ten loop examples um, in fight the four theory, which which lie in weights 12, 14, and 15, which have been computed by Panzer and Schnetz. So just a few years ago, this would have taken sort of hundreds of years of computing time to even come close to this sort of order of magnitude. But these guys have actually computed such examples. And they give Euler sums. So if you like, this is an experiment that's going to test this theorem. So Euler sums are, are things like minus 1 to the some power m1 to the k1. So I wrote this down in the first lecture, I think. So all the sums are certainly periods of this, of this, of motives of this type, and so you can, as I explained in the first lecture, you write down these um, these Euler sums, you place them with their metivic versions. So conjecturally, that's well defined, and you test this. You see whether the Galois conjugates involve a log two, and they don't. So a priori, such such a, a period sits in a. a 400-dimensional uh, vector space or something, but knowing that it doesn't have log 2 as a conjugate immediately reduces you down to a vector space about half the size. And that's exactly the sort of thing that I was talking about in the first lecture. But this is obtained by a completely trivial computation of small graphs. We get a very, very strong and highly non-trivial constraint at a very high loop order. And um, I'll try and finish up. So again, next we look at, we go up, we look at weight. We want to understand all periods of weight at most four, dialogues and things like this. We look at um, five edge graphs, and they're kind of easy, um, you know, so on and so forth. And it without doing any work whatsoever, it's completely obvious that the geometry of these hypersurfaces never produces a sixth root of unity. So a dialogue evaluated as sixth root of unity certainly never occurs as a period of such a graph. I don't have to work at all to do that. It's completely clear. Just um, and so a corollary, another corollary. Look at graphs and fight the fourth theory as above, such that the motive is mixed tate over Q adjoined sixth root of unity, unramified if you like. And certainly this very small subfamily of graphs by the main theorem never has, you can never produce 
uh, Li2 of zeta 6 as a conjugate. And conveniently, our good friends Panzer and Schnetz have found examples in fight the fourth theory um, of weight 11 and 8, 33 of weight 13. And they evaluate MZVs at sixth roots of unity. So they sit in the space of periods of mixed state motives at sixth roots of unity, some absolutely gigantic space at this weight. But we have this constraint that we know that the Galois conjugates can never be of this type. So immediately, by pure thought, we know that the amplitude, these very difficult graphs, has to lie in some much smaller subspace of possible amplitudes. And so on and so forth. So it's exactly what I promised in the first lecture. This is numerical. Yeah. So you, as I explained, you, you, you compute something. No, sorry, this is a, a theorem. So it's not numerical. It's, it's a theorem that is analytically proven to be exactly an MZV. And then you lift that number to the Mativic version, and you compute the, the, the Galois action, and you find that there's this, this strong constraint that it never has this. So if we keep going, uh, my expectation is that this, that the main theorem um, plus the small graphs principle will eventually completely explain uh, all the um, all the structure of the amplitudes we saw in the first lecture should explain, so I won't prove um, this coaction conjecture that I mentioned in the first lecture due to Oliver Schnetz, but it will, if you like, explain all the symptoms, all the consequence of this conjecture. So the first thing to do, I'm afraid I, I didn't do this yet because I didn't get around to it, but one needs to check, uh, need to check that there's no no z to 2, um, and work your way up. And this will explain why the, the amplitudes have the structure they have. So the conclusion um, is that the, the amplitudes in quantum field theory are, in some sense, full of holes. So we're used to the, the sort of plum pudding model of the atom. This is the Swiss cheese model of amplitudes. So this is a piece of Swiss cheese. So if you like, this is a picture of all periods. And um, sort of the, the, the cheese is going to be, so it's going to have holes in it. And the sort of cheese is the amplitudes in coming from Feynman integrals. And as you've shown, the, the, this, this group, this huge group, this cosmic Galois group, G-cos, is in this sense going to move these periods around. And what happens is you, you take a, a, a period here, like at, uh, at 11 or 13 loops or something, some crazy period that we have hard, a lot of trouble understanding, but the Galois group may send it into a period that in very low weight we have already eliminated. That means it, it can't occur, so that means there must be a hole up here. That all, all the things that map under the, the, the action of this group into a place where there was no period cannot have occurred. So. So that's a, a sort of intuitive picture of all the amplitudes in quantum field theory. And um, what remains to be done? So final comment. What remains to be done, questions, is to connect with, um, to understand gauge theories. We know that the amplitudes have some very special 
structures that um, cancellations and so forth that aren't true in this very general picture. To understand the connection with the normaliz renormalization, um, and there's a whole list of other questions, but I think I'll I'll stop here. Twenty years ahead of us. <laughs> <laughs> How do you reduce uh, to graphs a uh, small number of edges? So, um, so um, yeah, so we have some amplitude. Um, so we have some differential form in some Duran vector space. And the group moves it, the group acts on it, so it, it has some conjugate in the same space. And if it's of small weight, um, we know that it comes from this face map, comes from the boundary, by general theorems about Hodge's Hodge theory and, and weights. And then the face maps, um, because of this special geometry, the faces are themselves happen to be um, given by graph hypersurfaces. So if we looked at general periods, if you wrote down a, a general period, you'd have some complicated singularity of the integrand. And its Galois conjugates would be arbitrarily complicated because when you go into the boundary and blow up and take the limit, you'll find more and more complicated polynomials appearing and the whole situation's out of control. But the thing that's constraining uh, physics is that, the, um, that that doesn't happen. And when you go to the boundary, you only find graph polynomials of smaller graphs. And so that's what constrains, constrains everything. I don't know if that answered your question. So it's a combination of general theorems about weights and the fact that the, um, the geometry is, is very special. It's uh, exactly this equation here. So we never go outside the class of, 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 of graph hypersurfaces. And this explains why the, the Galois group is, in this sense, closed on. It, it, it sends Feynman amplitudes to Feynman amplitudes, in this sense. But still, in spite of the holes, as the weight increases, one gets more and more transcendental. Yeah, as the weight increases, so this is uh, the, the weight can going... Can characterize the ones that are left? More and more. No, I, but I, one has to ask uh, the, the right question. So it's not possible to keep just computing amplitudes to higher and higher loop order. We're looking, as I said in the first lecture, we look for theorems that are true for all amplitudes, that are true to all orders in perturbation theory. And here is a structure that is true is to all orders. So. Um, it's a negative constraint, that's the it's a negative constraint. but it may, this is not really the point. This is just to give um, examples of, 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 of very powerful predictive theorems that one can say about amplitudes. So if physicists are computing amplitudes, they'll do something numerical and try and fit it in some vector space. And this structure collapses the size of that vector space down to something small, so it has a practical application. But I don't think it's the main point. I think the main point is the existence of, of all this mathematics. Um, that's, that's the point. So the, the theorem is not restricted to convergence? Yes, it's restricted to convergence. Yeah. Uh, yes. So if you want to look at renormalized amplitudes, OK, so if you want to renormalize, um, then you can, um, if you renormalize in parametric space, what happens is that you um, you can cook up counter terms of, the, of this sort of type with a log of some numerators which are very, very close to graph polynomials. And so you have to control the geometry of these guys. And it's very close to the original geometry. So I don't think that the renormalized amplitudes, which give all these counter terms, will change much. And experience shows that the, the renormalized amplitudes of graphs of subdivergence is actually simpler than the, un, than the ones which are convergent. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, a, that's a, a, an important task is to um, fit this with the, the theory of renormalization. But the geometry is all there. It's all there in the blow-ups and the, the structure of the... I mean, just a vague question, but what are the possible periods? What are the possible periods? In physics, we don't know. We have no, no clue. So in the olden days, there were these conjectures um, in the case of fight the four theory that they would be all multiple zeta values, for example. 
And that's, um, so that's been a lot of work um, due to myself and collaborators showing that that's completely false. And so then if that's true, if physics is, is, is much more complicated than we expected, then what, what theorems are left to say about amplitudes? And this structure nevertheless uh, survives. Um, all these, these negative results, which are of the, t of the, of the type, Feynman amplitudes are much more complicated than we thought. So they're very, very complicated, but they still have extremely special class of numbers or functions in the class of all possible. And the constraint you found, do you think they are all the constraints? Or um, no, okay, so the, in the first lecture, I, I, I stated Schnetz's coaction conjecture, which stated that the periods of five to four are themselves closed. It's a very, very strong conjecture, and I'm skeptical about it. Um, experimentally, so they checked hundreds of examples, that gives all possible constraints. If you know the, the, the class of number, so if you look at those which are multiple zeta values, say, and you impose this coaction conjecture, then in fact that successfully predicts exactly the vector space of all the amplitudes you get. It gives exactly the right size. So that's... At that some point when, when the weight increases, you get new numbers. Yeah, when you get new numbers coming in, it's out of control. Well, we know that we get modular forms. Um, so the theorem of myself and Oliver um, is to prove at eight loops we get graphs whose motive is a motive of a modular form. And so we get um, a, a new type of number that's not been, doesn't have a name. And um, we expect it to get arbitrarily complicated. So as, as the, as the um, so the program of trying to describe explicitly the types of numbers coming in to the quantum field theories is hopeless, I think, because there we have lots of examples where things, at every loop order, there's historically every loop order, there's been a, a conjecture or, or several conjectures that have died a horrible death, that what we expected to be true was actually completely false. And this has gone on um, over the last few decades. So I think one can not be too pessimistic about the nature of amplitudes. How do you get a model for predicting sequence? Oh, so um, you have this, you have a graph hypersurface of an eight-loop graph. It's in some 18-dimensional space, P18 or something. It's a, a hypersurface of degree nine, and it has a million terms in it. And the claim is that its cohomology has a subquotient, which is the motive of a, a modular form. And you prove that by um, fibering it successively and doing some operations on the graph hyper surface to decrease the dimension down and down and down and eventually you get a K3 surface and the K3 surface, um, a singular K3 surface, you look it up in the classification and it's known that it's, it's, uh, it's modular in that case using modularity lifting terms. And so you know that the, the motive is a symmetric square of an elliptic curve. And that, that rules out, that means it can't possibly be a, a period of a a mixed state motive, it can't be a multiple zeta, it can't be any of these nice numbers we know. And so we have lots of examples like this of a wild nature where, um, where the cohomology looks as if it's going to be arbitrarily complicated. So the, the program, the original program that I explained, Cathy's original conjecture was given that we expected all these amplitudes to be MZVs, MZVs have a grouping acting on them, there should be a group acting on the amplitudes. But the original plan of trying to control all Feynman amplitudes is just not possible because we have these exotic counterexamples. But the, the group exists and, and, and that, that structure still, still works and is all the more surprising because the amplitudes um, go in a, a completely orthogonal direction to multiple zeta values or what we would have liked. So I, th I think that the program of trying to write down amplitudes explicitly or is, is, is beyond what's reasonable for the foreseeable future. But instead, we have these ideas coming from algebraic geometry. We have new invariants of amplitudes. Things we have representations instead of just looking at numbers. And we have weights. We have differential equations. We can use all that machinery. I think that's the way to go. Thank you. Okay, thank you.